Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Aude, mother and daughter in Academ. Uh, for uh, to discuss this topic, we have um, Daviana McGregor. She's a professor of ethnic studies and um, director of the Center for uh, Oral Studies, um, which is uh, part of ethnic studies. And uh, Rosie Aligado, she is in SOEST. So uh, maybe we try to um, have each of you, uh, beginning with Davy, something about you know your background, etc. And uh, then we go to Rosie and so forth. But uh, I wanted to say something that uh, this um, program we have done a previous program on that because actually it is mother, daughter, and father in, <laughs> in Academ, but uh, comrade uh, Dean Aligado passed on and we had uh, a program in his uh, memory commemorating uh, his accomplishments and so forth. So I just wanted to say that in the beginning. So uh, Devi, uh, please. Oh, aloha kako, nice to be here. and. Lonely uh, Kumakahiki, as we are in the season of the rains that come and bring our abundance that our, aku, our ancestors honored as uh, the Akua Lono. So blessings on all of our families and Ohana and also our Aina on the different islands. I've been teaching at the Department of Ethnic Studies now for 47 years this this fall <laughs> and, uh, and um, so I, yeah, I'd like to share uh, some of the work that um, I've been doing with the communities and how ethnic studies has really pioneered civic engagement and service learning. And um, Rosie sort of uh, grew up in the department since <laughs> we had to spend a lot of hours there in the department. So she was always there visiting and um, sort of our everybody's uh, young young daughter growing up with within our ethnic studies ohana. Aloha, I'm Rosie Aligato. And yes, both of my parents were professors in the Department of Ethnic Studies. And so I definitely consider myself to be a child of ethnic studies and have a lot of aloha for the department and the contributions that the faculty and staff have made to the community and to the university. And I definitely have as my foundations many of the principles that are taught through ethnic studies, ideas of um, critical race and critical theory. That's really the foundation of my science that I do. And I'm trained as a microbiologist, but I'm an oceanographer. And I have learned from my parents that it's critically important to conduct community embedded research. So research that's very much with the community, not on the community, and to, to bring into and to elevate the knowledge that multiple kinds of people and experts have. So I'm excited to share how my research has been influenced by ethnic studies. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. So, um, you know, let's begin, uh, since it's like the origin is ethnic studies. <laughs> Let's begin with uh, Davy, and uh, so uh, we, uh, you can say like even when uh, before civic engagement be, be became a term, etc. You, as you mentioned, uh, that uh, ethnic studies was involved in um, the in terms of the academic uh, research and also community and join those together to in uh, the notion or concept of praxis, as we say, this is theory and practice to impart uh, knowledge to students and so on and how students would um, develop uh, along those lines uh, whether they go into this uh, so-called hard sciences uh, you know or uh, the social sciences or humanities so please David. thank you i'm going to share some slides to help illustrate what i'm talking about and maybe uh, stir the memories of those who are, who are my generation and introduce new um, images for those who have not not yet born. <laughs> so let's see, we have, I said, the Department of Ethnic Studies, uh, when it's found, it had certain hallmarks that distinguished it from other departments. One was participatory action research. 
um, approach and methodologies involving our students in the communities to learn from the communities. We also had undergraduate, <coughs> excuse me, undergraduate lab leaders. Um, at the time, only the only um, graduates were teaching assistants. And, and then we had INA based service learning. And these are pictures from uh, 19, um, 1970. Well, this was for this one is 1977. This one is from 1972. The, no. the, the, the first battle when we um, uh, had to keep the program from being uh, dispersed into other departments such as American Studies and Anthropology. That's Buddy Ako talking who, from the Haula community. And then we had a like a two night sit in at Bachman Hall. Mm -hmm. And that, that was my first introduction to ethnic studies. My, I'm trained in history. I'm a, my PhD is in uh, Hawaiian and Pacific history. And I also have an MA in Pacific Island studies. But I started teaching in, and I graduated in 1972 and I started teaching in 1974. But in the Aina based um, approach to uh, education, um, we, we initiated what was called at the time geopolitical tours. And we did a lot of focus initially on Windward Oahu, um, looking at the time the Heia Meadowland and Fish Pond were all uh, planned to be a, as big a d development as Hawaii Kai, where there would be a golf course and high rises and a marina for the boats. The, the fish pond was going to be dredged to become a marina like the Kuapa fish pond at Hawaii Kai. And so there was a lot of emphasis to oppose that, I remember. And then it all kind of culminated in trying to stop H3 because it, originally when H3 was going to go in, they were also going to realign Kamehameha Highway to be four lanes or even as much as six lanes was, the, the, I think more, four, more so four lanes. So there was a lot of, of focus and long time energy spent to try to stop H3 from being constructed and because of damage it would do to Halava Valley. Well, first Wanalua Valley and now Halava Valley. We, we weren't successful because President, I mean, Senator Inouye, you know, exempted it from the environmental protection laws. Um, but the tours also, I, in my class, I also took my students to Molokai to learn about the struggles there for access, especially as the uh, plantations were then phasing out what was the impact on Native Hawaiians. And then when Koholabe access became legal in 1980, I also began to take my students from ES221 Hawaiians class to Koholabe to learn um, of the struggles there and uh, the whole struggle to stop the bombing and then to revive our culture. And even on campus, my students worked together with Uncle Harry Mitchell from Kenai Maui. Um, this is actually, uh, that's Rosie on my back. Um, that's uh, Pali Ahui, I think. And then there's Keone Fairbanks and Noho Lucas and um, uh, Vinny and Akela Kanyao Pio Crozier. And we were all there. This is a picture of the first day that the water flowed into the, the lo'i here on campus. Um, and Uncle Harry said, Ho'okahe when the water flows, the land will live. And, and that um, lo'i has now expanded from that first one with that water to a, a whole network of lo'i and, and a, a bit become a major center for learning about Hawaiian uh, ecosystems and agriculture and irrigation networks on the campus itself. I'll stop there and let Rosie uh, share about her community embedded research. Great, Mahalo. I'm going to share just a bit and then going to hand it back to my mom. Um, so, you know, I've taken a lot of inspiration from the geopolitical tours um, that were established with ethnic studies. And in my teaching, I teach two major classes. One is aquatic pollution, and the pictures there are showing from our site visits for our students to understand the impact of urbanization on our water system. So we go to the sewage treatment plant and really get down and dirty, and they can kind of see what happens. Um, my students learn about current water issues in that class, and then I actually teach them how to write and then submit public testimony on current legislation um, in Hawaii. And then the second class that I teach my Kekai Mai Keola, uh, we visit different areas that are relevant to um, oceanic food sovereignty. And so one is we go to Heia Fish Pond. I don't have a picture here. The, this picture is showing our visit to the fish market and the fish auction, which is a place that a lot of people don't get to go in to see that our fish comes from the longline fisheries and then it 
it goes out, it can even be sold to market on the continent or it can go to our Hawaii restaurants. And then we also go to Oceanic Institute. Um, another inspiration um, as far as participatory based approaches is that I try to bring the community to UH. So I organized a number of community expert panels around these topics, a number of community lecturers. So we have had in, in my Kai Maikeola class on fisheries, we've had the community based subsistence fishery group from Haena come and talk. We've had Conservation International come and talk. And we've also had um, Kua Aina Ulu Awamo, which is a nonprofit group that's really dedicated to empowering communities. So those are some of the so those are some of the research as I mean some some of the educational aspects, and I'm going to touch on one more class, but I'm going to do it later on in our um, in our talk. And so so um, the other the other kind of inspiration that I took as as my mom mentioned is that you know ethnic studies had these undergraduate lab leaders that really provided this experiential you know this experience. One of the other hats that I wear is that I'm the director of the SOAS Miley Mentoring Program. And when I entered SOAS, we had literally a handful of, SOAS does the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. We had literally a handful of local students. We had on one hand, graduate students who are local and we had just me who was the only professor who was local. And so we decided to kind of build on the model of peer mentoring support to create um, this, this multi-tiered um, mentoring um, to attract and nurture um, Kama'aina into degree programs and and just wanting to say that the transfer becomes a personal experience because what we learned is we take our students and then we kind of do a lot of community service projects and ways so that they can engage with the local community so that the transfer becomes a personal experience. So I'll stop there for now. Um, I have a question uh, for you, uh, Rosie. <clears throat> So um, some people say, okay, you're in SOWIST and you're, you know, a microbiologist and oceanographer and all of that. Um, what has this got to do with uh, the science <laughs> that you have uh, specialized in? So what would you say? Well, I think it's really important to um, acknowledge and appreciate that in order to solve some of society's biggest problems, we need diverse solutions. We need solutions from people who have different lived experiences. And so it's so important that we look to people who are living in these spaces who are on the front lines of a lot of this change, a lot of the climate change, a lot of the places that are affected by um, pollution, you know, social justice has really result, you know, um, injustice really and and, and and disparity of where a lot of this pollution is happening, most of the burden has been borne by marginalized communities. And so it's very important to go and highlight and see these communities and to, to, to elevate those who are working to change those solutions. In the, um, in, in the COP26, one thing that we acknowledged and realized was is that our indigenous communities are really some of the biggest protectors. And so highlighting them and, 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 and putting their work and their knowledge on parity with Western science is something that we really have to do. Yeah, and uh, you know, um, I can um, like surmise from what you're saying also that, uh, in fact, um, your students who are in the hard sciences, so to speak, would benefit from the ways in which they might direct their science to serve the community rather than just like up in the air or for big corporations and so on, but uh, something that would solve problems within the community, especially now we're talking about uh, environmental justice and the rest of it, yeah. Okay, thanks, yeah. Davy. Yeah, I wanted to continue to share how the, um, the programs developed uh, from ethnic studies as the pioneer and these, um, you know, um, specialized geopolitical tours focused on community issues of that moment uh, had, had evo has evolved now into um, uh, in our college, the College of Social Sciences, um, what they call access program that uh, ha uh, provides community engagement experiences and service learning to all of the various departments within the college. 
And one of the programs in particular that draws upon the ethnic studies experience on place-based learning is called Malama Ina Ahupua'a. And they provide service learning opportunities uh, also for other community colleges. And they place the students in uh, various communities that now are more engaged in stewardship than uh, being threatened at the time that we initiated these programs with development. So Heia Fish Pond, for example, the development at Heia Fish Pond never came to be, was stopped. And the Kamehameha Schools made an exchange with the state of Hawaii for land in Kaka'ako. And um, the state then acquired um, the lands of Heia Malka of Kamehameha Highway. And now that area is being developed, I'm not done, but it's being uh, cultivated by um, Kako'o Iwi as a, a community um, uh, lo'ikalo system, uh, drawing upon the experiences at Kane White that um, Uncle Harry and my students had begun with the Hawaiian language students at um, Kapapalo'io Kane Wai, we talked about. Uh, and, and the fish pond has now flourished under the support of Kamehameha schools more fully that now that it's not intent on developing it into a marina, they wholeheartedly have gone into supporting the um, reopening of that fish pond. Well, not reopening, actually closing that wall and, and um, having that fish pond become productive. So while a lot of the projects that in the 70s, well, when we started 74, really in the 80s, that our students and faculty were involved in organizing around were, 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 were in, in, a, in a defensive mode and trying to protect these lands for, for um, cultivation and agriculture and, and food sovereignty in, in essence. Um, not, now that having succeeded in protecting these lands from development, the focus is on cultural stewardship. And I wanted to show again that picture of Koholabe because Koholabe is a big example. When my students first went to Koholabe in the 80s, the, the island was still being bombed. Even though we were able to access the island, the Protect Lavi Ohana was limited to one third of the island, while another third could still be bombed by the military. There were out of a year um, for 10 months, 10 days and 10 months, the military had to stop bombing the island and um, begin to do a cleanup of the unexploded ordnance and allow the Protect Lavi Ohana within that 10 day period to come and reestablish Pilina and connection with the island. And so began programs of cultural stewardship and more importantly, programs of reopening um, uh, Native Hawaiian religious ceremonies and practices, particularly the makahiki ceremonies that is of this time and season. So that's myself with Rosie up at Mo'ula'iki, which was, this is an area, this platform here was a school for training of astronomers at Mo'ula'iki. This is the lele where the whole kupu uh, offerings are put to Lono. And um, the, the calling of the rains in this season through ceremony is now an important part of the cultural stewardship of the island. And that's matched by the hands-on work that we do by students coming, Malama and Ahupua students coming together to do the hands-on work to clear the land of invasive species and help the native uh, plants come back to life. So now the focus is on cultural stewardship that the land is no longer threatened and, um, and being uh, abused by the US Navy. And I'll stop there and turn it over to Rosie. Yeah, um, you know, uh, just a quick comment and um, I see you and Rosie might want to talk about it, um, discuss it, which is uh, actually, this is um, a good example of um, community-based uh, social research, uh, which you have written quite a bit about. And so here we find uh, the relationship between uh, research and generating uh, knowledge to impart to our students yeah, from that community. And so that is a very nice uh, relationship. And again, uh, to make the point is uh, that uh, it uh, shows the inter um, interrelationship, not only overlap, but interrelationship of uh, 
the so-called hard sciences with the social sciences and humanities in the service of the community. So any comments for you or Rosie are welcome on that. Well, well our next section is going to talk about the whole um, uh, participatory action research approach. But in, in the transition, Rosie is going to share about her program that she started to link faculty and graduate students and how can they do their, their research uh, uh, responsibly within the community. Thanks, mom. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk now about um, some efforts that I made. One of the, one of the tensions I think that we, and of course this is very reductionist because academic researchers are not a monolith and neither are communities, but what we noted, one of the things we noticed is that oftentimes a lot of the tension that arises are because there's different issues, interests, and needs that we see. You know, academic researchers, at least in STEM, are on grant cycles. We want to get our papers out. We want to graduate our students. We're, we're chasing the next grant. Um, and, and whereas community members are often on the time scale of generations and lifetime, and you know, if they're put, if, you know, if they're in a place and serving a place, they have another job. They're doing this on the side, and so. Oftentimes it can be in conflict, but we really wanted to try and find a way to find the sweet spot where how can we have generative rather than extractive relationships. And when we can find that, we feel that that's where we can really leverage a shared vision. We can, we can bring together more resources than either could individually. We can co-produce knowledge and devise new and novel teaching. And I think this is really what ethnic studies does well. And so it's something that I really looked to translate from the social sciences to the hard sciences, because across Hawaii, there are hundreds of researchers who are doing like, I guess you could say hard science researchers doing work in Hawaii's communities. And those relationships are not always, you know, ideal. So we developed this process. I just wanted to define the words because I think it's important to define um, Hawaiian terms. So kulana really means your rank, your stance, your attitude. It's how do you carry yourself? It's your posture. Do you, are you kind of shame when you're walking in the community bent over or maybe you, you don't want anybody to notice what you're doing? Or are you kind of walking in an open way? And then noi'i kind of modifies that. It, it means to seek knowledge or information to investigate. And so when you put it together, it's kind of what are your research attitudes? How do you carry yourself? You know, this really started by, again, working with communities who saw this as an issue and wanted to do better. Again, this group, Kua Aina Ulu Awamo, helped to facilitate the bringing together of different community groups. We also, because so much of my work um, is in Heia, and I knew the Heia practitioners and I knew what their issues were, we started by working in Heia. And so this a lot of this really came from the communication and the relationships that we strove to repair as well as build. So we had workshops with the stewards, with community, and also with the researchers to kind of come together and understand what everybody's perspective was. And then we also leaned on a big, broader body of academic literature because there has been so much participatory research outside of STEM, right? So there's been participatory research in, in social sciences and also in the medical field, but in STEM, there wasn't a guidance. So this is really what we put together. It is kind of um, a guidance document. It's not a checklist. And what we realized was we kind of distilled it down to eight hulana or eight standards. And the booklet has best practices. And what I really like about it is we developed questions for researchers to ask themselves and for community so that they can figure out if this is um, a project that really works for them. And it considers multiple perspectives and it's flexible because it's not like you must do this. It's how would you do this? This is the first four is building and nurturing a relationship. And I think you'll see that these are things that are very obvious and, and universal across all relationships. How do we have respect? for as a researcher coming in for this place that, that people have, have occupied and lived on this land for many, many generations. How can we have reciprocal relationships that aren't just extractive in one way? As researchers, we have to be self-aware of the fact that we're not just representing ourselves, we also carry the history of our department, of our university. You know, sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. And then how do we establish good means of communication um, throughout the process? And then the second four are really maintaining that process. So a'o aku a'omai, 
learning and teaching and aloha aku aloha my um receiving affection and giving ref really ref affection and care and it's I, the idea that our research is just one piece in the long-term plan of a place and so we need to think about how our research fits into the long-term focus of that community community engagement and co-review how do we bring in um, the true experts of this place into helping us to develop these questions. We might have the fancy equipment, but they have the on the ground knowledge. And then um, this is something that's evolving more towards knowledge stewardship is really the idea that this information isn't really the researchers to own, maybe isn't even the universities to own. It really comes from the land itself. And, and the people of that place should have the right to access it and utilize it to their benefit. And then of course, when things fall apart, how can we um, work together? So I just wanted to kind of show you how that process worked really quickly. These are some of the researchers that came together and you know we have expanded it so that we are also training new researchers in this so that we can build capacity at, in the university to have that. We also have been working with the Center for Teaching Excellence to um, create workshop series, and we had over 70 participants from 14 different departments. And I'm proud to say that members of the Ethnic Studies um, Department were often our models of people who had engaged and been able to integrate community practices across their teaching, across their research um, in these. And so, you know, I, I called up my aunties and uncles and said, can you come in? And my mom and said, can you come in and help us out with these with these projects? And so to date, since we started Kulana Noi'i, um, we've held in the past four years, we've had about dozens of workshops and, and over 600 people have been trained um, through our Kulana Noi'i process. And we're starting to work with government entities as well. So um, DLNR has expressed interest in um, working with us, DAR, as well as um, non other nonprofits. So for example, the Hawaii Island Land Trust has expressed interest in how can we adopt um, this process for for their for their own usage when, when researchers want to work on on those those lands with those communities. Um, and so I think I think I'll stop there. I and um, and hope that kind of kind of yeah. gives you an idea of 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 how we started to um, help yeah. transition those ideas. Right. Um, I in one of the photos I saw part of. Uh, Taika Vika Tengan, who's the <laughs> department chair of ethnic studies, he's an anthropologist too. So that, but also, um, you know, I mentioned like how uh, the research is based on the community, etc. So uh, it is important for us to recognize that we are, uh, you know, working on the shoulders of uh, giants in the field, like you know, Marion Kelly, the late Marion Kelly who like uh, trailblazed uh, a whole uh, section of anthropology relating to Hawaii, etc. And we all benefited from it, not only in terms of the research, but also in terms of uh, uh, methodologies uh, for teaching our students. And, uh, you know, whether it's uh, in the community or in the classroom. And Davy uh, can uh, uh, say something about that, especially because uh, you're also the director of the Center for, uh, uh, you know, uh, oral history. Oral, uh, yeah, Center for Oral History that did a lot of um, interviews with uh, different people. So please. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wanted to share some of the work then in terms of research um, that has both um, provided breakthroughs in understanding uh, Hawaiian um, social systems and cultural practices and at the same time protected those practices and um, and been effective for those communities in identifying resources that and their and documenting their practices when uh, there's change that that would be destructive of those areas that that are being proposed so um, I work together myself um, with colleagues in uh, the Department of Urban Regional Planning Dr. Luciana Minerbi and in the School of Social Work, Dr. John Matsuoka, and the three of us work together. We called ourselves Can Do. Uh, it meant um, uh, uh, develop something like uh, cultural 
uh, alternatives, developing options. So, uh, and so one of our first projects was to work with the Molokai community and the Department of Land and Natural Resources to document the extent to which subsistence is practiced on Molokai. And the problem is that in our economy and an economic analysis, we always look at the market sector and especially tourism now. And we look at the government sector, including you know, federal spending, military spending, government, state spending. But what is overlooked is the subsistence sector, which is really significant in Hawaii for native Hawaiians, maybe not across a neighbor islands, local people on neighbor islands. And, and if you go throughout the Pacific, the subsistence sector is really very still dominant in places like Fiji and Vanuatu, where you know where the depending still have an extensive village system and village ownership of lands. Uh, so we did a, a subsistence uh, report with the community uh, and, and DLNR participating. And um, this is a map we did. We um, developed a new system to do these interviews using um, maps. And we would have, this is actually a, um, a regular GI, GPS map or GIS map or top, topo map, I guess. And we asked people to put where they do different kinds of subsistence. So fishing, there is the open circle and ocean gatherings, the cold circle. And you can see that subsistence taking place very widely across the island. And of course, we wanted to make the dots and the arrows so that it wouldn't identify their spots, but at least you would see the areas that are being used. We use multiple survey methods. So we did interviews with individuals where we had them map where their uh, resources were. We did focus groups with, with you know, groups in Mauna Loa, in Ho'olehua, in Kaunakakai, and the East End, and they would map their areas. And then we also did an across the island phone survey, random sample. The random sample survey showed that about, for across the island, about 28% of the people, you know, or the people, 28% uh, of their diet comes from subsistence resources. But for Native Hawaiians, 38% of their food and diet comes from um, subsistence, fishing, farming and gathering and hunting. Um, and this was back in 1994. Uh, since then, um, the, the major hotel on the West End has closed and um, the, um, there's been more loss of jobs. So, I believe that if we were to do the survey today, the subsistence uh, resources use would be much higher. One of the proposals that came out of that subsistence study was to develop a community-based subsistence fishing area, which the legislature passed a law to set up and adapt. And they set up a uh, originally a, a pilot study to take place here at Mo'omomi. Uh, and uh, we are currently in the process of trying to now get the entire coastline from Ilio Point to Nihoa, all this coastline designated a community-based subsistence fishing area. But other areas in Haena have adopted this, and they have established a community-based subsistence fishing area at Haena on Kauai. And on Maui, uh, the Kipahulu community is now in the process of establishing this same kind of management area. And uh, Milolii on Hawaii Island is also using this designation that was initiated out of this study, uh, really a proposal of Mac Poipoi, who was the vice chair of the, of the uh, Molokai Subsistence Task Force that Governor Waihe'e had appointed. And his idea uh, grew out of this process. And when his idea was then taken to the legislature now, it's being implemented in all of these uh, communities. Uh, another example is that I was brought in to uh, be part of a study that was done with Group 70 International and Cultural Surveys Hawaii to show what is a historical cultural landscape in Hawaii, because this was a new designation that the Hawaii, Preserva uh, Hawaii Preservation Law had established. And in the continent, it included areas like Mount Vernon and the whole plantation system or, you know, a mine and all of the mining in landscape and geography. But in Hawaii, what does a cultural historic, historical cultural landscape uh, consist of? And so we did a study in Kenai Wailua Nui. These are the, the taro patches here in Wailua Nui. This is Ed Went, who's one of the taro patches in 
um, Wailuanui. And we, I interviewed uh, the kupuna there, mostly about their water systems and their irrigation networks, where their sources of water come from. Um, the concerns emerged about the diversion of the stream waters there and the impact it had on the flow of the water into their, their Loikalo systems and the, the clogging of the streams by the how bush. Anyway, um, later, as a result of the, you know, from the, the, the resources that we gathered from this study and the interviews that I conducted with the study um, were put together into testimony that I was able to provide to show the importance and the continuity, the long-term continuity of taro cultivation in these areas. Um, that was very important to, to support the East Maui farmers in their efforts to have um, diverted waters that now plantations, uh, sugar plantations that were closing in Pu'unene and um, South Maui, and as they were closing, would no longer have a need for the continuing diversion of these waters. And the East Maui taro farmers had, I think, almost an eight to 10 year uh, court litigation to force East Maui Irrigation Company to return those waters to East Maui and to return the flow to the East Maui streams. So this study was important in that it informed me and gave me the basis to help provide that kind of expert testimony. And I did a similar thing in the Waiaholi Waikani water case interviewing um, taro farmers in Waihole and uh, Kahana and Waikani and Hakipu'u and documenting the kind of uses that water uh, uh, provides for cultural practices and, and, and um, how much water is needed to support traditional and cultural Hawaiian practices which are protected under the water code. And again, this kind of testimony was able, based on the um, interviews that I conducted with Tara farmers, was able to help uh, in part provide, uh, help provide some of the justification for the return of the water that was being diverted from, from Waihe'e from, um, over to Kahana to the Leeward Oahu and help restore those uh, stream waters to continue the flow of those waters uh, there. And um, the studies were, that I conducted were put together in a book that I published in 2007 called Nakua Aina, Living Hawaiian Culture. And it looked at the continuity of Hawaiian, traditional Hawaiian culture and practice in rural areas of our island, islands from Kenai and um, Wailuanui to Puna and to um, uh, Molo the island of Molokai. And, and how those practices came together to help revive cultural practices on Koho'olawe. So I'll stop there. Yeah, um, I just um, wanted to say like, um, <clears throat> we talked about it before Rosie, about um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, it stands for that. And uh, that uh, all these examples show, in fact, uh, the relationship between the hard sciences and um, the social sciences and humanities in the service of the community and not so much for other kinds of issues. On one of the maps, uh, on Molokai maps, I saw that um, the Nature Conservancy had uh, uh, perhaps more, uh, well, um, uh, equal uh, acreage of land to the Hawaiian homelands, maybe a little bit <laughs> more. <laughs> Do you know anything about that? Just, you know, I'm curious. Um, the Nature Conservancy um, has lands that are adjacent to the Hawaiian homelands and are also surrounded by Molokai Ranch. I don't know the actual acreage, but it's, it's no. not at all the, to the extent that there are Hawaiian homelands up there. Um, and they're, um, they're uh, restoring the, the uh, native coastal ecosystem there. Mm -hmm. And it, it has attracted back the Uwaukani, the the yeah. seabirds that are ground nesting and yeah. um, has it provides a preserve, but that's also part of the area that would be part of the community-based subsistence fishing area. Yeah, yeah. No, I uh, just uh, was curious about <laughs> that. Uh, I'm for uh, nature conservancy. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Rosie, uh, anything? Uh, we still have like about 20 minutes, so, you know. Yeah, can... Rosie was going to share some. Yeah, 
Um, mm. So, I mean, I've actually, it's good that I'm sli- sharing my own slides because I'm kind of inserting things on the fly. Um, <laughs> and so I kind of inspired by what my mom said, I thought I could give another example of how traditional knowledge can really be brought to the fore in a very, um, in a, in a very like key way. Um, and so to that, I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit about how, um, how I've used, um, you know, potentially Hawaiian language newspapers, maybe, um, to, to kind of look at and, and, and think about climate change. Is that something that you think would be, would be of interest or, um, uh, it's really yeah. inspired by, by some of what <laughs> it's really inspired by, by, um, the work that, that, um, that kind of my mom was talking about. What really struck me, and the reason why I wanted to highlight this project, has to do with the diversions in East Maui, and I'm, and I think it's important for us to kind of think about how all of these, how a lot of times we don't have a huge historical context uh, in why did people do things, and we we see oh you know, a lot of times we don't have that additional factor of what was happening in the environment, what was happening to the climate at that time. And I think it's really important. And so one project that I've been looking at is to look to our Hawaiian language newspapers and look to our actual living, you know, ancestral practitioners and and to see if we can um, gain more information about what they knew about the environment and to integrate that into our, our current model. So just to remind you all that newspapers were these repositories of customary knowledge. And this comes from Kalama Hawaii in 1834, uh, where the editor is putting out this call that says, please write into this new medium, right? Newspapers in 1834 in Hawaii were this new medium. And it says, once you pass away, traditional knowledge may disappear completely. So to avoid that, let it be printed as a sign that the chiefs care about the things of old. And and so this repository that we have is such a treasure. It, It spans over 100 years and over 100 newspapers. And we have like 1.5 million letter page sizes of text that, that really speak to the voices and the knowledge of the peoples of the past that can inform our present and future. So for example, if we wanted to know what does El Nino look like in Hawaii, right? If we just sit down and we think, okay, it's wetter than normal, but it's not like we have normal storms. It's not like winter storms. It's that we might have more um, hurricanes or more flooding. We also might say, okay, um, there might be higher sea surface temperatures. We know from the news there's coral bleaching, maybe some fish kills. And then if the, and we also know there's a lot of Kona weather, like the trade winds are weak. And so if the volcano is also happening at the same time, we'll experience fog. And we also know that the winter is drier than normal. So that might mean that we might have some drought, some famine or some low stream flow. So what we can kind of do with those initial observations is we can then kind of think about how did these our local practitioners kind of interpret these patterns. So we know that um, even the word El Nino has been appropriated by climate scientists and that actually El Nino was a term that indigenous Chilean fishermen had developed in the 17th century when they recognized that there were abnormalities in their fish catch that in the winter when there were warmer temperatures, there would be less fish. And we also know that traditional um, um, pr- practitioners in Samoa have a term for El Nino and it's called kaimake. And it's because the winds physically blow the water across the Pacific and effectively lower the sea level so that the tops of their coral heads are exposed and die. And that's the scent of the de- you know the dead oceans. So in Hawaii, we were wondering what are our words for for um, El Nino, and we kind of had those observations that I was just talking about. So my methodology is that thanks to digitization of our newspapers, we can search them and we can think about what might the keyword searches be, and we can develop a vocabulary or a lexicon that describes some of these long term climate phenomena. And the importance of doing that, although it's a retrospective analysis, is that by refining our knowledge of historical events that will help us to understand and and refine present and future models because our models for climate all depend on the data that we have accumulated so if we can add to that data we can refine our models particularly of what might happen in hawaii 
And so on the right, I'm showing you some examples of vocabulary that refer to climate phenomena that, that we have found in the newspapers. So there's references to pestilence, plant diseases, droughts, storms. And so these are the kind of words that we can then use and look and see if we see patterns. So here's an example. Um, if we just look at one newspaper, and this looks at um, this one is one of those hundred newspapers between 1869 and 1900, and we look at how often is the word rain mentioned, and is it mentioned more than normal or less than normal, and um, and we can then normalize the issues. And so what I'm showing you here is this example highlighted in green is in this period of time in the late 1870s in Hawaii there was less mention of rain than normal and more mention of droughts. And if we look at our historical record, we can see that that overlaps with an El Nino. So we can see that our, we, can, we, we know that people in Hawaii were experiencing um, conditions. And the reason why I wanted to bring it up, inspired by what my mom talked about on East Maui is because those conditions were present in 1878 and what happened in 1878, the Clouts Freckles Ditch was constructed to justify the diversion of water from the from taro farmers to the sugarcane plantation. So this is a translation actually from the newspaper, and you can pull out all this information. So this is in Kaupo, which is in East Maui. There is crisis now in this land. Rain hasn't fallen. The land is parched, and it's as if God is keeping prosperity on this side of Kipahulu, and there's no rain. And then this is Kahikinui. The features of this land, this land at this time are not like before, and it's as if it has been burned by fire. The mountain is scorching and there is no grass growing. And so it's really interesting because at this point of time, you have this merger of Westerners coming in and being freaked out by this. But then if they had actually been able to consult the practitioners, maybe they would have realized that this was just a single cycle and that the rain would return and the rain would come back. But instead, because they were really freaked out about their economy and the sugar economy, they used this short-term weather pattern to justify going and building all of these ditch systems, which of course has impacted Hawaii today. And so I think this is really important because this shows us that our ancestors had a very clear idea of the hydrological patterns and that that really has an influence with policy and we have to make those connections and really be aware of of before we make policy for future and present day we really need to have an understanding of what our ancestors knew um, of, of those conditions so so that's just an example that was inspired by the, the work that my mom did that that where we can where we can take something that's a social political issue we can bring it into and incorporate in and have a holistic view that really gives us a whole picture that can help us to come up with better policy for, for our communities. Yeah, I mean, again here, how indigenous knowledge is important and the Westerners would come anywhere, like uh, whether it's India or <laughs> the Pacific, uh, what have you, and uh, begin to screw things up. Uh, you know, uh, this is one uh, good example you um, uh, you brought up because uh, they didn't think like, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, Kanaka Maoli, for instance, uh, have anything to teach them. They wanted to teach the Kanaka Maoli. And, well, the rest is history, geography, and politics. Anyway, so Davy, uh, anything on that or whatever else you uh, want to talk uh, about? So I, I left off talking about my, um, my book, Nakua Aina, Living Hawaiian Culture. And I think that Building upon my experiences, similar to what Rosie was saying, that um, the work that I did in Kenai Wailua Nui documenting this very long history of continuous cultivation of the land and taro. I mean, we, when uh, cultural surveys found the maps from the 1850s and 60s, and the, the layout of the taro patches were the same as the maps that cultural surveys drew of the layout of the Lo'ikalo in 1994, they were the same. So these systems were there on the land for um, that many decades. Uh, and luckily in Wailua Nui, they still had a source from a, a spring that was not diverted. But with the, re with the work that we did to show there, there had been more cultivation in, the, in Wailua Nui 
when there was the free flow of water, the East Taro farmers were able to use that information to make the justification to return the water to Wailua Nui, which has now expanded taro production in Wailua Nui. And they're having programs, you know, involving the, um, the students from HANA to come and learn how to cultivate taro and then serve it in the school and, and to share it with their families. But the, the other experiences from Puna and, and their whole experience living in the shadow of, you know, Pele and the volcano and how Puna as an area um, was also very rural. I mean, even today, it still is off the grid pretty much. Um, and it has been a very important area for the Pele traditional customs and practices to, to flourish. And that the development of geothermal energy there was threatening that resource and th threatening that you know, of, of Pele. Uh, and then, as I explained about Molokai, the importance of subsistence and the, the flourishing of the natural resources to support families who still rely large, largely on hunting and fishing and gathering. So bringing all those stories together created a bigger picture of the importance of rural Hawaiian communities that were isolated from the mainstream changes in Hawaii and the economic changes that swept through the islands. And these small pockets of Hawaiian cultural custom and practice were really important in perpetuating Hawaiian language, Hawaiian culture, cultural customs, beliefs, and practices. And these were rooted on continuing to be able to apply traditional Hawaiian knowledge to taro cultivation and to fishing and to, to hunting. Uh, and then these practices were then carried as lessons to our generation with us to Kaho'olawe, where we have applied that, that traditional cultural knowledge, that ike kupuna, as we say, to how do we best steward Kaho'olawe? How do we revive the island of Kaho'olawe, which was devastated by the bombing and, and you know, erosion from the uh, cattle and, and sheep ranching? How do we now revive a, a Hawaiian ecosystem to again thrive and, and nourish. So the lessons from these um, rural communities and the kupuna and now the makua who are growing up in these communities is vital for us to learn how to how are we going to survive in Hawaii? How do we anticipate the changes that will come with climate changes and sea level rise? How do we prepare ourselves? How can we rely upon this knowledge that is in the newspapers, can be passed on orally to prepare us for the future. <clears throat> yeah, so um, it's interesting you mentioned, uh, we're mentioning uh, climate change. Uh, once I had uh, uh, Chip Fletcher, um, he's also a source, and I'm sure Rosie, you know the guy, probably worked with, with him. So I, um, I just want to ask two questions. One, uh, um, did you work with him, you know, on uh, uh, certain things, one? And two, um, uh, uh, any kind of uh, ideas, reflections, your reflections on uh, climate, uh, on the Climate Change Conference, the recent one, since, uh, you know, it has impact on Hawaii, whether it's a Nino or what have you. Yes, so... Um Chip is actually the chair of the Honolulu Climate Change Commission, and I'm the vice chair. And so we have been working together on um, for crafting guidances around um, numerous different aspects of policy for the city and county of Honolulu. And I think that, well, I, I was really, it was, it, I mean, wasn't it a spectacle? It was kind of a spectacle, COP26, because there were thousands and thousands of people and different levels of people could participate. And then you had the protests. Um, and then ultimately, I would say it, I was actually quite disappointed with with what came out of it. And, and the fact that we didn't really condemn, um, you know, coal, um, you know, very just, you know, universally, and that we kind of backed off on that. So um, I don't know, I'm, I'm I, I, here's what I do know. I know that indigenous people around the world are the ones who are on the front lines of this change, whether or not it's Pacific Islanders in Oceania or you know, people of South of America, um, 
trying to fight the deforestation or if it's the people of Canada trying to fight further um, you know fossil fuel pipelines from 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 going through their count from their territories so so we we are the ones who are fighting these battles and I think that we really we have proven that that we are survivors through the apocalypse that was the genocide of our own societies. You know, it's really interesting that I hear a lot of fear, a lot of fear based like, oh my God, we have to ring the alarm bell now. And people say it's gonna be the end of society, but I think it's really gonna be the end of, of Western society, of capitalist society. And, and while that is a scary thing, and while there will be really serious consequences, the hope that I have is that indigenous peoples around the world you know, from the Middle East to Africa, we have already survived some of the worst genocidal experiences. We've already had our apocalypse and we're still here. And so we should listen to the indigenous peoples of those places because we know how to survive in those places. We know how to eke out our, our, our survival. And so that's, I think, I think the research that my mom has shown and the research that I'm beginning to do um, really emphasize and highlight um those ideas yeah well that's um that's wonderful because uh you know the uh, glasgow conference was um, um you know basically uh disappointing to say the least you know um and really it didn't get to anywhere in terms of trying to stop and reverse um, the climate change uh, catastrophe etc what you said about indigenous uh, people is true. And so there are some uh, social scientists who talk about indigenous knowledge is the one that uh, would most probably help us survive this climate change if we listen to that and uh, be guided by it. So that's an interesting one. We have a few more minutes left. Uh, so Davy, um, any final words on uh, that and also on your future work and uh, you know we have like uh, <clears throat> one minute actually um something about center for oral history you know a quick thing yeah, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> yeah uh, i think um our, our center for oral history has a lot to contribute with this idea of documenting um indigenous knowledge and not uh, and our kama aina too, you know, our local people in Hawaii who have, who are the fishers and who are the hunters and who are really close, have that relationship and they're, they've been observing the changes in the reefs and uh, along the shorelines, uh, the limuhui, you know, it's, it's not just Native Hawaiians, it's, 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 it's all local people really. Uh, and, and, our, and our kupuna, be they of Hawaiian or in, you know, Japanese or Filipino ancestry, they, these kupuna have been, uh, who are fishers and farmers and hunters and gatherers have been observing these changes. And so it's important that we get their understanding and what have they observed over time so we can have baselines, but, and also do projections. And uh, we, we are looking, our, our department um, is looking at partnering to do some coastal shoreline, um, observations with, with and, um, and the NOAA has some effort doing that direction. But we're also working with the national parks on okay. um, in Kona yeah. now to document yeah. that. Sorry, well, we have to wrap yeah. up. Um, mahalo no iloa. Thank you, Davy. Thank you, Rosie. Um, thank you, um, uh, listeners, uh, viewers. And see you in February of next year. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha.